this is the answer right here. I'm going to say, Ashton, what am I looking at here? Is this a uh, fancy artwork? You're looking at perpetual motion. You're looking at perpetual motion. You are looking at the universe right here. You are looking at the universe right here. So you see you've got, can I change the shape of this? There we go. Like that. It's, you've got this matrix, this grid format. And you can see there are things moving around in it, but there's still conservation, which means that everything that moves causes something else to move back into place. So all that's really happening in this image you look at is matter is just moving around, being replaced by one, one from one spot with the other. And pressure simply causes this to occur. You've got this pressure that's formed. And so you have these lines that get basically form in the lattice structure like rivers basically flowing through the lattice structure. This is basically how the universe works. So why is this so big? So when I talk about some of these physics concepts, I want you to imagine this image. When I talk about things being in equilibrium, I'm talking about when everything is frozen, like these parts of this image right here, you see that are not moving at all. The parts that are pretty much stationary here, the parts that aren't the river, this is equilibrium. Equilibrium means it's everything is matched up. All the positive and minuses are matched up. Everything is chill. Non-equilibrium, asymmetry, is the stuff that's moving around, like the waterfall. Remember, what's an example of asymmetry? Example of asymmetry is the waterfall. We can harness energy from a waterfall. The waterfall is just there because of nature. Because of the topology of nature itself, this waterfall exists. Water is flowing from up here to down here. And we can just tap into that water and use it as a water mill. We can we can make energy out of it. This is the same thing we can do with space-time itself. So why is it so important that space is not empty? Because when space is not empty, this is our reality now. Now we look at this and we go, wait a minute. If I want to get free energy... All I have to do is ride the wave. All I have to do is ride one of these waves or make one of these waves. And do you want to know what these waves are that you're looking at moving around here throughout this graphic? Those are gravity waves. If the dots are the space time, then what you're seeing there are the gravity waves. You're seeing warp drives. This is an image of warp drives moving around throughout the lattice structure of our space time universe. They're moving under their own accord, as opposed to just the Earth, which is stuck in a particular spot that's not moving under its own control. These would be warp drives that are moving under their own control using the asymmetry, moving the space-time around, moving the space-time around to cause thrust. And the most important part, like when Sabine, Haasenfelder, and the rest say that warp drives violate conservation. No, they don't. This is why they don't violate conservation. You're looking at it right here. Nothing in this image is violating conservation. There's nothing excess being created in this image. Things are just being moved around. That's it. And this is why they don't understand negative energy. Because in a negative energy situation, you can create a ripple like these little ripples moving around through this image. And because of conservation, they must eventually balance out. Hmm. Sabine! She let us down, chat. Now, I've got another image for you. Because I love these images. For me, I'm a visual learner. So when I'm trying to learn how these concepts work, I need something like this to really wrap my brain around it. And this one, I saw this one. This is the best image to understand the lattice structure of space-time itself as an energy fluid where the matter is moving through and where you have these ripples, gravity waves that we can harness, that we can tap into these asymmetries. And these asymmetries can be used to generate electricity. They can be used to move around and avoid inertia. Here's another image for you. This is a visualization of gravity this is what gravity really is. so i just showed you one visualization of gravity how does matter like in a planet now in this image 
Imagine, we can see the lattice structure. The lattice structure is the matrix grid of the blue lines. So imagine a situation where there's no planet there. You just imagine just rows and columns of cubes that are unimpacted. That's our zero point energy. So our space time has this lattice structure, has this lattice structure. And when matter, when positive matter like the earth or you or me, impact this touch this space time it bends the space time this is what we refer to when we're talking about bending the space time however you visualize it however you want to conceptualize it this is the visualization of that effect is that what's happening here is that the geometry of the lattice structure is actually changing this is what the idea of bending space time is the geometry of the lattice structure changes now watch this closely now that i've described it as the, the earth gets moved around, you can see how the lattice structure kind of folds in. This is a visualization of gravity. Now, let's go back to the beginning of this image. Or actually, let's just watch it for a second here. So you can see how wherever it moves, it manipulates that zero point and it manipulates that lattice structure. So we're creating those ripples just like we saw in the previous image. We're clearing these little ripples here. Now, anywhere where you were to exist, this is the thing I want to point. I'm going to connect this now to time travel for you. Okay. Look at the grid structure and look at the earth. However much bending, however much warping you see of that curve structure, of that lattice space-time structure, that thing we're calling gravity, however much bending of that you see, warping of that you see, that determines your interval rate of time. What? Yes. However much that lattice structure is being stretched determines how your rate of time flows. Now, before you freak out, the reason why you don't feel this is because for you, time is always flowing normally. There's no such thing as warped time for you because our perspective of our reality, we're all on the same earth. But if you were to go into outer space and you were on the part of this lattice structure that's not bent, your time is going to flow at a different rate than somebody who's on earth. Literally, your time will flow at a different rate. No ambiguity about it. So what you're seeing here is actually a visualization, not just of gravity, and not just of how planets manipulate the space-time structure, the zero-point energy. You're actually seeing a visualization of the flow of time, of the different rates of time. So somebody on the Earth, on the surface of the Earth, where you see the, the, the warping is higher, is going to have a different rate of time, slower rate of time, than somebody who's in deep outer space where there's no mass near them. And it gets even worse. The more the mass is on this planet, the more warping there is. And this is why when you go near a black hole, your time stops. When you approach the black hole, the warping is so much that time will seem to stop for the people who are looking at you. And this is the idea of how even a wormhole becomes theoretically possible. And that's the reason why I wanted to pull that up. So that's your visualization. So two, those are two of probably some of the best visualizations I've seen all year. So the first one, uh, let me share these again. Oh, well, we're sneaking ahead to the next one, but that's fine. Okay, so the first one here, um, seeing the visualization of you know perpetual motion, how perpetual motion is possible, seeing the visualization of the warp drive through the through the um, space time structure. And this one here, seeing the geometry of how it's bent, seeing how time flows at different rates based on the, the warping of the space-time structure itself. Specifically, the beginning here is the best, like seeing this right there. And then this last image here, this, is, this one's just for the dudes. This one's just for the hardcore dudes right here. What this is essentially saying is that a helix structure is a combination of a sine and a cosine wave. And what's happening is that we are missing a dimension. That like It's almost like we aren't seeing the big picture of everything. There's an extra dimension that we are missing 
And in my opinion, that's why entanglement exists. Is that all points in space and time are really connected. But we live in this, we're limited and we're stuck, contained in this three-dimensional reality that we can't see the rest of. And this is why helix structures, vortex structures, sine waves are so significant because these are the physical manifestations of that extra dimension in our limited three-dimensional reality. The same way, the same way where a two-dimensional video game character could never escape from their two-dimensional reality because they're stuck in the screen. We're stuck in this zero point energy, this lattice structure of space time you see all around you. But what this opens the door up to, it doesn't limit us. Actually, quite the opposite. Because now, now that we looked at these images, now we've seen we're in a matrix. We're in a matrix and the matrix itself stores energy. So how do you escape from the matrix? Tap into the energy of the matrix itself. Tap into the source code of it. That's how you escape from the matrix. The hafnium conspiracy. I did a little Googling on it to get some background on this because I wasn't really sure. And I wanted to have it compared to some of the theories that I've put forth. And I got to be honest, the AI is pretty, pretty crappy, at least at this. AI is not good at doing subjective analysis. It's good at just doing math and numbers and regurgitating data. But even having and trying to do comparisons, unless you're specific, it's really bad. But what I do want to point out, so the Hafnium conspiracy is this idea that you can have an atom be in an excited state for a significant period of time and then unlock that energy at will. That's the basic idea boiled down. And when I heard that, I went, holy shit, are you kidding me? Because when we look at the MH370 videos, we can see there's very clearly a big release of energy where a plane disappears. So that has to be a huge release of energy. And presumably it reappears somewhere else. And Hal Putoff's ground state of the hydrogen atom, Hal Putoff has been saying that every atom, the reason why the electron spins around the atom and doesn't crash into the atom is because it's absorbing energy from the zero point energy, from that lattice structure. Hal Putoff saying that every atom is connected to the lattice structure of space time and it pulls energy out of it as needed to, to go back into equilibrium. Just like that graphic we were showing. Constantly trying to go back to equilibrium. But if this is true, then in theory, this should allow for us to use that energy and basically bounce off of that energy like a trampoline. In theory, we should be able to pull some of that energy out of the space-time structure and store it here, and then it's going to release. We should basically be able to pluck a string on a guitar and yank some of that energy out, and we should see a reaction. We should see that occur. So if that's the case, this sounds, this hafnium conspiracy sounds really, really similar to zero-point energy, and it sounds really similar to Randall Mills' hydrino theory, where the hydrogen atom has stable states at fractions of the orbital. Because all this is about is like, imagine your electron is spinning around your atom. How it spins around the atom is actually a wave function. And there are stable wave functions where that wave will be in a standing wave, meaning that it perfectly fits between the walls of the orbital path. I believe that that explains the electron orbitals themselves. So if there are stable waveforms at higher or lower values than baseline, then in theory you have created or opened the door from a physics perspective to create a trampoline effect. And that's what the hafnium theory is basically saying. 
They're saying they figured out this one element will cause a basic instantaneous release of energy that can be stored up and ready to be released whenever you want. I have to say, guys, I am not ready to go all in on this, but there's a slight non-zero chance that what we're seeing in the MH370 videos is some form of hafnium bomb. I don't know what the classification of it is. I've presumed it to be a fusion bomb, but maybe from a technical perspective, there's not actually fusion occurring there. Maybe there it is some kind of new weapon type that doesn't have a classification. So anyway, hafnium conspiracy, I thought was really interesting because it all goes back to once again, the atom, nuclear power, nuclear energy. And people need to understand the difference between fission and fusion and what it really means when we're tapping in to these, to these energies. Because it may be that we're not just getting the chemical energy out, the strict chemical reaction. If there is a lattice structure of space-time, it means we're actually tapping in to that lattice structure of space time, which means if this is true, that what we would expect is when we start doing these fusion experiments, we're starting to see anomalous energy gain, energy gain that goes beyond what would be output from a chemical perspective. If we start to see that, we're going to know right away, zero point energy is real, space time's not empty, all of the above.